Good afternoon. Um, my name is Marcus Noland. I am the Executive Vice President and Director of Studies here at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And it is my honor and pleasure to welcome you to our meeting on the new global trade agenda. Today we uh, have two mega regional deals on the horizon while the WTO languishes. We are delighted to be joined this afternoon by Pascal Lamy, who will share with us his recent thinking on TPP, TTIP, and the prospect for multilateral trade negotiations. In addition to Mr. Lamy, we are joined by two highly insightful discussants, Robert Zellick and Annabel Gonzalez. I cannot imagine a, be a trio better placed to help us understand what it all means. As the cliche goes, this is a trio that literally needs no introduction, but I will bow to tradition and provide brief introductions. Pascal Lamy is the President Emeritus of Notre Europe Institute Jacques Delors. From 2005 to 2013, he was direct General Director of the World Trade Organization, a committed European and a member of the French Socialist Party. He was Chief of Staff for the President of the European Commission, Jacques Delors, from 1985 to 1994. He then joined Credit Lyonnais as CEO until 1999 before returning to Brussels as European Trade Commissioner until 2004. We have two discussants who will comment on Mr. Lamy's presentation. Thinking about these remarks this afternoon, I was not sure which of our discussants I should introduce first. I thought maybe I should go ladies first, or alphabetically or perhaps age before beauty. Ms. Gonzalez wins on two of three criteria. Annabel Gonzalez has been Senior Director of the World Bank Group Global Practice on Trade and Competitiveness since July 1, 2014. Previously, she served as Costa Rica's Minister of Foreign Trade, Director to Agriculture and Commodities Division of the World Trade Organization, and as Director General for International Trade Negotiations in the Ministry of Foreign Trade of Costa Rica. She is concurrently leading the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on Competitiveness. Robert Zellick is chairman of Goldman Sachs International Advisors. He was the president of the World Bank Group from 2007 until 2012. He served in President George W. Bush's cabinet as U.S. Trade Representative from 2001 to 2005, as Deputy Secretary of State from 2005 to 2006. From 1985 to 1993, Mr. Zellick worked in the Treasury and State Departments in various capacities, including Counselor to the Secretary of Treasury and Under Secretary of State, as well as briefly in the White House as Deputy Chief of Staff. Our format this afternoon is that Mr. Lamy will first present his remarks, and then will be joined on stage by Ms. Gonzalez and Mr. Zellick, who will offer their comments. I will then open up the proceedings to Q&A with the audience. So without further ado, I turn the podium over to Pascal Lamy. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me thank the uh, Peterson Institute for the uh, invitation. Uh, let me also thank the Peterson Institute for having chosen as uh, discussants uh, two close friends. This is always a bit less risky than otherwise. So welcome, uh, Annabelle. Welcome, uh, Bob. Uh, a few remarks uh, in order to introduce our discussion will be devoted to this theme of the new uh, global agenda uh, for trade. And my basic point will be to try and help us all understanding uh, what is the new in this uh, new uh, global trade agenda. As a starting point, a few reminders. Uh, so that we basically uh, adopt uh, the proper reasoning in the same mind frame. Uh, number one, uh, opening trade uh, works, is good for growth, welfare, under a number of conditions. These conditions uh, being uh, mostly of a domestic nature, and this is not within uh, the discussion uh, today. So the main issue uh, is then uh, how do you remove uh, obstacle to trade and to some extent to investment. Obstacle to trade are uh, of uh, two uh, categories. 
The first one is uh, distance. Uh, technology is uh, taking care of that. And each wave of uh, technological developments uh, since uh, many, many centuries uh, has been about shrinking the cost of uh, distance. Again, not a topic uh, for this afternoon, although there is a close connection uh, between this uh, capacity of technology to cross uh, the cost of distance and proper infrastructures and uh, logistics. And then the second category of obstacle to trade uh, is uh, regulations. Uh, and uh, trade uh, regulations have uh, traditionally had a main purpose, uh, which was to protect uh, producers from uh, foreign competition, tariffs, uh, subsidies, uh, restrictions to public procurement, regulation of services in such a way that uh, foreign services providers do not have the same uh, market access uh, than, uh, by definition, your domestic producers. So that's, for a long time, been the main reason for trade regulation. The other uh, purpose of trade regulation uh, is uh, not to protect uh, producers from foreign competition, but to protect consumers from uh, various risks. And that has to do uh, with uh, health, environment, uh, standards, uh, safety of toys, uh, lighters, uh, flowers, uh, cars. Uh, prudential regulations in banking insurance, uh, data, privacy, and the rest. There is a third regulation, uh, which is about protecting uh, investors. Uh, but this, uh, for the moment, I will also leave aside, although there is a close connection uh, between uh, trade opening and uh, investment uh, opening. Now, in what I start calling the old world of trade, which was mostly about removing obstacles to trade related to protection of producers. Uh, you have an international regime, uh, which is the multilateral one, GATT, uh, then uh, WTO. And uh, you have uh, other regimes uh, which are uh, more trade open, i.e. less protecting your producers uh, through uh, bilateral uh, regional agreements that uh, grant preferences, uh, i.e. more trade open deals than the multilateral one. So in this universe of protection, uh, you've got an international regime which is fairly consistent plus uh, bilateral or regional regimes. That's for the world of protection of producers. In the world of precaution of consumers, you do have a few, very few, areas uh, which are uh, internationally regulated. Uh, there is a bit of that in the Codex Alimentarius for food uh, standards. There is a bit of that in the International Office uh, for Animal uh, Health in terms of uh, uh, animal diseases. There is a bit of that in some environmental agreements in areas like uh, chemical products, for instance. But as compared to the multilateral system of regulating protection, there is very little. Most of that has to do uh, with domestic regimes, which is precautionary standards which countries impose at their border when you want to export either goods or services to this country. And to the difference of protection, this regulation of uh, precaution is also now in the hands of private players. Tariffs or subsidies is something that have to do with public authorities. Precautionary standards on how green is my beans or how green are my flowers is something that I, Walmart or Carrefour uh, or Ahold uh, will decide in order to be nicer 
to the part of a consumer that likes me being greener. So if I'm Walmart or Carrefour and I decide to adopt the pesticide residue standard, which is more stringent than the national one, or the international one, if there was to be an international one, the impact I will have on producers, i.e. the sort of trade impact I will have, will be as big as if I was a regulatory public authority. And this has to be factored in, of course. Now, this paints uh, a picture from the previous world where the main issue was protection of producers uh, to a new world where the main issue becomes the precaution for consumers. And there are many reasons for this structural shift to happen. Uh, less attention on, protec on protection because of technology crushing the cost of distance, making multi-localization of production processes easier, making economies of scale and international specialization more efficient. Hence, resulting in a average growth of uh, the import content of exports, which was 20% 20 years ago, which probably will be 60% uh, 20 years from now. Now, the moment 60% of your exports are imports to which you add value, shooting on your imports makes no sense. It's great to respect international disciplines and WTO standards, and, but, I mean, there's something better than disciplines, which is good sense. Uh, and good sense tell you more and more that shooting on your imports, i.e. protecting your producers, is less and less meaningful or efficient, hence uh, reliable as a tool. On the other side, precaution is uh, growing spool feed. And the reason why precaution is growing food speed is simply because people are getting less poor on average on this planet, which is great. Uh, they are getting uh, more uh, into areas which they didn't care before. Uh, and uh, one of the great things about becoming less poor is that uh, you acquire the right to care about other than just surviving or feeding your kids next week. Uh, which is great, uh, which is acquiring the right to dream. Uh, the flip side of this being that if you acquire the right to dream, you also acquire the, the right to nightmare. And precaution is basically about nightmare. Now, there is, I happen to a school of thought that doesn't believe nightmares are bad. They are. They tell you something. Uh, so nightmares are nightmares, and they are the revelation of a sort of anxiety. Uh, which has to do uh, with the fact that uh, you start caring, again, about other than just survival, about risk, about whether things are good or bad, going in the right direction, bad direction, whether food is good, whether environment is good, whether even social standards are good. That's the shift. These things become more and more important. More and more millions, if not billions of people care about that and less and less care about the impact on uh, protection of producers. And this is why trade uh, regulation, trade negotiation uh, is uh, changing. In roughly, uh, to be short, uh, what I would qualify as uh, three generations. One which is uh, the old generation, uh, GATT, uh, NAFTA, WTO, 90s, uh, one which I would say is a new generation with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and watch, uh, one which is an even newer generation, uh, which is uh, what's ongoing with the uh, TTIP, the Trade uh, Transatlantic Investment Partnership. First generation, uh, the old generation, uh, was mostly about uh, reducing protection. Uh, with uh, a focus on uh, goods, uh, services, uh, and notably in goods agriculture. Uh, did a great job in this direction, although for the moment uh, locked in terms of establishing multilateral uh, tariffs standards uh, and locked mostly uh, because of uh, agriculture, as we all know. 
The other area which this first generation uh, coped properly with and which have to do with this uh, protection versus uh, precaution uh, was uh, the regulation, the administration, the regulation, the judiciarization of uh, the existing gray zone between uh, precaution and protection, which is when precaution can be manipulated for protection purposes. And there are two agreements in the WTO <coughs> system, uh, SPS sanitary and phytosanitary agreement and the technical barriers to trade agreement, which establish a proper balance between the legitimacy of protecting health, for instance, and the legitimacy of obstructing trade. And these basic principles have been detailed, sophisticated, to some extent augmented, uh, by the uh, WTO dispute settlement jurisprudence. So the gray zone between protection and precaution is in the present system acknowledged, recognized, and regulated. What this system does not do, and never did so far multilaterally, uh, was uh, establishing links which were advocated by some, notably uh, EU and uh, Democrat administrations in the US uh, between uh, trade opening and uh, core labor standards, environmental standards, uh, anti-corruption standards. There were various attempts. Remember, there are a few there in this room who are old enough to remember Seattle. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Seattle broke down. EU and US on the one side, EU quite aggressive, US quite aggressively, EU less aggressively at the time wanted this to happen, developing countries refused in the name that this would be tantamount to establishing a new kind of protectionism uh, while we had to get rid of the rest, and it didn't happen. And the other thing that does not pertain to this uh, initial first-generation system is uh, anything like a multilateral investment regime. For the same reason, uh, developing countries at the time uh, opposed it. There's a little bit of that through mode three in the services area in WTO, but nothing uh, which, which would look like the beginning of a multilateral investment regime. Second generation in this transition from what I call the old world to the new world, Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was just uh, concluded, uh, and which uh, remains to be ratified. Uh, and we all know that uh, all details about TPP uh, have not yet been released. So there's a lot in the detail uh, which hasn't gone uh, public at this stage. But roughly speaking, what we know is that TPP will have a relatively modest trade opening content. So the protection reduction side of TPP is not very uh, impressive uh, and for several reasons, the first one being the heterogeneity of the countries participating in TPP, the second one being, and I think it's no secret here in Washington, that uh, extracting any trade concession from Congress is such a pain uh, that the available currency for the US to pay uh, trade opening is uh, in limited quantity. So in production reduction, if you don't pay, you don't get. If you pay little, you get little, which is, in my view, what happened with the TPP. But, but there is a big change in the TPP in that uh, the US uh, extracted from uh, developing countries who multilaterally had enough of a coalition to resist it in taking them separately, and notably uh, Vietnam and Malaysia, while the uh, Pacific uh, Latin American countries have never been a big problem on this issue, uh, is this uh, linkage between trade opening, labor standards, environmental standards, and anti-corruption standards. On this, TPP is a real breakthrough. Uh, again, uh, details uh, remain to be released, but it's not only a question of principle. There are, in TPP, processes for implementation of these linkages, uh, which I think are very uh, much stronger than what existed so far. 
uh, which in a way look more like what US and EU had extracted from a number of developing countries with their preferential regimes, with the GSP uh, and, uh, and the like. And that, of course, is a, is a big step forward. Uh, in my view, more of a political breakthrough than a purely economic breakthrough, uh, but something very important and which, to be frank, and without ruffling any of my good friend uh, Zulik's feathers, uh, something which is specific to a Democrat administration. I don't think a Republican administration would have gone that way so far in uh, pushing on these issues. Third uh, generation, uh, TTIP. Uh, which is, uh, as compared to the two other ones, not much probably on trade opening, not least because what remains to be opened in reducing protection on both sides of the Atlantic is limited. There's a bit of that in textile closing, uh, SUVs, uh, special steels, uh, ceramic on the, U on the US side. There's a bit of that in agriculture on both sides, but frankly speaking, nothing really important. Don't expect anything significant in TTIP except good words on linkage between trade opening, labor, environment, and anti-corruption for a simple reason, which is that EU and US are already at par compared to the rest of the world in terms of a linkage between trade opening and multilateral or international regimes in labor, environment, or corruption where the TTIP will have to break ground, and I'm not saying it will, I think the jury is still out for a variety of reasons, where the TTIP will have to break ground is on regulatory convergence, which is this notion that uh, US and EU could agree, A, on uh, the same level of precaution throughout goods and services, and just as importantly for producers, not only the same level of precaution, but the same level of administering precaution, which is, if I'm a producer, what really matters. Uh, if I'm a producer of uh, roses, uh, US and EU may have the same pesticide residue level, uh, but if they administer it in such a different way in terms of whether I have to pay or not to be certified, whether inspectors have to come next week, next year, uh, whether I have to fill uh, how much uh, paperwork, I basically have to segregate my production or the impact on my capacity to realize economies of scale with a single standard is deeply affected by the way this standard is uh, administered. So that's the big game. That's where TTIP really makes sense. This is where the two levels, of the two highest level of precaution on this planet which are EU and US, uh, could agree to converge, thus de facto uh, creating the uh, world standard on precaution in, again, a variety of goods and services. Now, final point, uh, if I'm correct in this shift, in the description of what's happening, and in the fact that these various categories of trade discussions or trade agreements uh, are on the itinerary from the new world to the, uh, from the old world to the new world. Uh, we just have to recognize that this uh, transition uh, entails uh, major uh, changes, uh, which I think haven't yet been openly uh, debated or enough debated. Uh, a few examples of that, uh, not an exhaustive list. One, in the world of precaution, preferences disappear. So the whole part of the trade temple, which was based on special and differential treatment, let's have a trade policy that eases trade for the least developed countries, and the rest, uh, if you are in the business of precaution, disappears. I can have a zero tariff for Rwandan roses, 10% for Costa Rica, sorry, uh, Annabelle, 20% uh, for Israel. That makes sense in the old world because Rwanda is less developed than Costa Rica, which is less developed than Israel. 
I'll never do that with pesticide residues. No way I can administer at my border a specific pesticide residue for Wanda, which would be a bit more lax than the one for Costa Rica, which would be a, no way. Just doesn't make sense, just not out of think. This changes a lot of things in the way uh, developing countries will have to adjust uh, to trade regulation. And notably, it gives more importance to their effective capacity to match these levels of precaution which are imposed on them by notably EU and US. They will still be imposed, by the way, as they are imposed today. I don't think uh, US administration or EU administration has ever consulted Wanda on what was the proper level of pesticide residues. They just listen to their science experts, medics, uh, who tell them uh, this uh, level of microgram is uh, good for health and above it's bad. And Wanda has no say on that. Now, if EU and US converge, Wanda won't have a say either, but Wanda will have the same, which again is a uh, very good news for Wanda because Wanda will be able to realize economies of scale which weren't there in the previous world. But it's a big change. It means that this doctrine, again, that developed countries could favor development through discrimination, affirmative discrimination in trade doesn't work anymore because precaution is by definition MFA. What changes also is, and we've seen that in the huge turbulences which are uh, in Europe, notably and more specifically in Germany, uh, about TTIP, is the political economy of relationship to producers and consumers. In the old world, I roughly had my domestic producers against me and my domestic consumers with me. Producers didn't like me because I was increasing competition and consumers liked me because I was providing cheaper prices. In the new world, in the world of precaution, it's exactly the other way around. I get consumers against me uh, because they're afraid that I'm going to open trade at a price for the precaution they care about, the syndrome of uh, precaution dumping, which is exactly the problem German public opinion has uh, now with the TTIP. And I have producers on my side because producers like leveling the playing field in terms of standards, and they even accept that if the result of that is a higher standard, the benefit they draw from economies of scale is higher than the cost they will have to engage to match a bit of a higher standard. At least that's what I've seen in Europe with the chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, food industry, car industry. In some cases, seen from the European side, not all, there are other cases where the other way around, if you want to harmonize EU and US, EU will have to go up, and in some cases, US will have to go up. And the question for producers is whether the cost of that is a good deal uh, or not, as com compared to the benefits uh, I'm making. Another thing that changes, uh, and we've seen that again in TTIP, is the growing importance of transparency in uh, legitimi legitimization of, of trade policy and trade negotiations. I mean, already at the time where the issue was about protection of producers, you needed some transparency. If it's about precaution for consumers, you need a lot of transparency. And this is where, in my view, uh, TTIP got a very bad start because on both sides, the promoters of TTIP didn't realize that they were not talking about the same thing as in the past. Their narrative of how new the game was uh, was, in my view, uh, wrong. And finally, what changes, and this opens a whole bag of uh, totally new issues, uh, is that the world of, precaution, of protection was reasonably flat in terms of values, in terms of ideology, in terms of uh, imagination. And bicycles are the same everywhere on this planet. Scrap metal is the same 
always in this planet. And exchanging a tariff on scrap metal against a tariff on bicycles is no big game. There's nothing that connects to passion. It's all rational. And the only question is how much for how much. In the area of precaution, it's a totally uh, different world uh, because precaution is about uh, risk. And risk is about a scale between good and bad. And as we know on this planet, uh, and that's one of the charms of human diversity, uh, scales of values between good and bad uh, are quite different uh, on a number of issues. And because they are different, uh, they entail different attitudes vis-a-vis -vis precaution, different levels, different priorities. Uh, and this takes us into a much more complex world where negotiating some sort of convergence on precaution uh, will be tough. Now, it might not be the case for crash tests for cars, which probably a few engineers uh, can uh, do. Uh, if it's about data privacy, as we've seen with a recent uh, court case in EU on the safe harbor, uh, if it's about uh, GMOs, uh, if it's about uh, prudential regulation, as we've seen in the US attitude in TTIP, about whether uh, there should be convergence in precautionary standards and services, that's a different ballgame. Uh, and this, again, opens a new world, which I think is in many ways a more difficult world, which means that in some way, we, if we want to keep benefiting from economies of scale of globalization, there's still a long way to go in, again, leveling the playing field anywhere else than downward in uh, precaution. Uh, fascinating exercise, but probably intellectually philosophically, politically more difficult, uh, which is, I think, what we have to expect for the decades to come. Thanks for your attention. So I don't know if this is um, the old world of uh, volume and price or the new world of uh, precaution, but we have definitely given you uh, volume. Uh, we have uh, two discussants to, uh, to discuss uh, uh, Pascal's very interesting uh, and stimulating remarks, uh, Annabelle Gonzalez and Bob Zellick. Would you like to, since Bob's still fiddling with his microphone, would you, would you like right. to start? All right. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Marcus, and uh, thank you very much for uh, hosting us uh, here today. Um, I'd like to uh, start by saying that uh, Pascal Lamy is an influential uh, trade uh, practitioner. Uh, under his uh, leadership in, uh, in the WTO, uh, he worked to strengthen the institution uh, quite, uh, quite significantly. And um, let me uh, mention three, three examples that come to mind. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, as a watchdog of uh, protectionism uh, with the G20 uh, uh, trade monitor reports. Uh, then uh, he, the, the institution also played a central role in the collective response uh, to the financial crisis, uh, for instance, in the area of uh, trade facilitation. Um, and he also shaped the trade agenda uh, by being one of the first leaders to emphasize uh, the trans transformational power of uh, global value chains. Uh, but as we heard uh, today, uh, he's also a uh, global thinker. 
contributing with uh, provoking uh, ideas uh, to the debate on the current state of world trade, uh, the global trading system, uh, and their, their future. So he made reference today uh, to uh, two systemic uh, shifts uh, that are at uh, work. Uh, one is uh, transitioning from a world of national production systems uh, to a world of uh, cross-border production. And the second one is uh, moving uh, from a world where uh, trade barriers were mostly about uh, protest protecting uh, domestic uh, producers uh, to one where uh, cross-country differences in the protection of consumers uh, are the main source of trade cost because of the divergent uh, national regulatory uh, systems. So this uh, changes uh, the scope of, uh, of uh, trade agreements, and uh, he's made reference to this uh, sort of a, a transition in three generations. Um, an Italian uh, friend of mine uh, likes to uh, think of this uh, uh, in the context of um, uh, an old movie by Sofia Loren and uh, Marcello Mastroianni that is called uh, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. Uh, so um, yesterday agreements uh, are basically about eliminating uh, border measures, uh, most notably tariffs. Uh, not that we did not pay attention to, uh, to uh, non-tariff measures, but we did mostly in the context of uh, thinking about them as uh, substitutes to trade policy. Uh, in the case of uh, the Today Agreements, uh, they, are, they have a wider scope. Uh, they are deeper in that they include uh, provisions uh, on uh, investment, competition policy, intellectual property rights, uh, and other. And one important driver of them, of course, is that uh, world-class uh, cross, uh, with um, cross-border uh, production, uh, these domestic policies have important uh, spillover uh, effects. Now, in the case of tomorrow's uh, agreements, uh, it's even more ambitious. They aim at uh, making compatible the divergent national regulatory systems, either through harmonization or through mu mutual uh, recognition, to reduce the compliant cost uh, for firms uh, and increase the efficiency, of course, of, um, of global value chains. Now, the, the widening and the changing uh, scope of trade agreements, in turn, also has an impact on the size and the geography uh, of the agreements. And this is, of course, what we are, uh, what we are seeing now. Because deeper uh, agreements require negotiation, not only uh, you know, about tariffs, but of the uh, policies themselves, uh, leading to large coordination uh, problems. Um, and this is why uh, these deals are generally uh, possible or feasible more uh, among countries uh, that, uh, that are not too distant in terms of uh, policy uh, preferences. Now, they also impact the negotiating uh, dynamics because it's not, and uh, Pascal made reference to this, it's not about, uh, no longer that much about uh, a reciprocal exchange of concessions, although we see that uh, a little bit at the, at the end of the negotiations in particular, but it's more, um, it's more about uh, coordination uh, and convergence. And in this world of coordination and convergence, uh, exchange of information becomes uh, vital. Um, uh, trust building processes among uh, parties are also uh, quite relevant. So this is why uh, preferential trade agreements have become so popular, and in my view, will continue to be uh, uh, very popular uh, for the uh, foreseeable future. Now, of course, many agreements contain, uh, I mean, this is not such a clear-cut uh, uh, distinction. Many agreements contain elements of, uh, of yesterday, of today, uh, and tomorrow, and Pascal said, you know, the GATT is clearly uh, an agreement from that perspective of yesterday. TTIP aims at being uh, the agreement of uh, tomorrow. And uh, in the case of TPP, I think um, it's mostly a today agreement, and I think Pascal was referring to that, but I think it's a little bit of a, of a strange animal in one sense. Um, on the one hand, you know, size matters. And uh, of course, this is an agreement that covers 40% of global GDP and, and the like. And it seems to be an exception to this inverse law of uh, the depth and size uh, of trade agreements. Uh, and the second point is that although being mostly a today uh, agreement, it does seem to contain uh, some innovative uh, elements in terms of some uh, annexes related to the regulation of uh, specific sectors uh, to promote uh, common regulatory approaches uh, among, uh, among members. 
So with this sort of framework in mind, I'd like to address uh, two specific questions that I believe are very relevant uh, to us uh, at the World Bank Group. Um, and the first one is, uh, what are the risks and opportunities for developing countries uh, in this evolving structure of uh, trade agreements? Um, and here, you know, the concerns, as, as we probably know, is that preferential trade agreements, and in, in particular mega-regional trade agreements, uh, could undermine uh, the relevance of the multilateral trading system, uh, which is the forum where the uh, voices of the smaller developing countries are heard uh, the, the loudest. Uh, so the concerns are, I think, well understood. On the one hand, there is the risk of uh, fragmentation. Uh, the WTO uh, uniform rules uh, have a value, of course, uh, and segmentation creates uh, cost. So different rules uh, and disciplines in preferential trade agreements uh, create costs uh, for trade firms. The second risk um, is, of course, the risk of exclusion, because Countries negotiating TPP or TTIP or any trade, uh, uh, bilateral or regional trade agreement for that matter, do not take into account uh, the concerns of uh, non-members uh, of that uh, agreement. And this can generate uh, some negative spillovers uh, on, uh, on those non-members, the magnitude of which would depend on uh, how much trade and investment barriers are reduced on a, on a discriminatory basis. And I will come back to this in a, in a moment. And third, there is a, it's always a concern in the case of the developing countries that are part of this agreement that maybe there is a little bit of a sense of unfairness in, this, in the sense that some of the rules and disciplines uh, of, the, of the agreement may be more suited uh, to the advanced countries uh, in the negotiations, owing, of course, the, uh, to their larger um, negotiating power. Now, having said all this, I believe that there is, um, there are, there's very, very, I mean, there are a lot of reasons to be uh, optimistic. Uh, first, the reality is that the provisions in many of the today's and tomorrow's agreements are non-discriminatory. Uh, if, you, if you are talking, for instance, about regulatory barriers or a new services regime, this is not something that you can uh, actually say, I'm only going to apply this to members. Uh, in many cases, it doesn't make uh, sense. In many cases, it's simply not possible. Uh, and there are also a number of provisions in these agreements that are simply not discriminatory at all. Uh, if you think, for instance, about a commitment uh, to join an intellectual property convention, this has no discriminatory elements uh, uh, to it. So that's a very uh, first important point. The second point is that this preferential agreements uh, can stimulate innovation through a laboratory effect. Um, you know, developing countries can look at these agreements, uh, at the, their impact, and can then decide uh, to take some of these provisions and take them forward in another uh, preferential trade agreements or in the WTO. If you look, for instance, at what happened with uh, NAFTA, uh, you know, NAFTA got spread in the whole of the Americas, for example, uh, and in their provisions, the provisions in many of these agreements are very much identical uh, to that agreement. Or uh, arguably, this is also the uh, sort of like the basis of the trade facilitation agreement in the, in the WTO context. The third point is that um, deep integration uh, provisions uh, offer a commitment device uh, to drive domestic economic reforms. Uh, and this commitment is essential uh, if you come to think about it in areas such as uh, uh, competition or services uh, um, regimes or state-owned enterprises. And, you know, I must say that I believe that this is the most important uh, impact of an agreement like this. And uh, I can, think, I can uh, talk from the experience of my own uh, country in a previous uh, world uh, when we negotiated uh, the um, U.S. Uh, Central America Free Trade Agreement. Uh, where Costa Rica committed to opening up the telecom uh, monopoly that had been in place for a long time. A very, a very um, um, difficult decision, one that uh, led to the agreement being ratified by the first and only referendum ever in the history of the country, but that today, uh, five years later, after the uh, provisions of the opening of the telecom having come into place, uh, it has been uh, a success story. And if it wouldn't have been because of that agreement, I'm not sure that, uh, that uh, we would have been able to open the monopoly uh, as, um, you know, at least for, uh, for some time now. So this is a very important uh, element. And finally, uh, I think preferential trade agreements, particularly the larger ones, ha have a contagious effect. Uh, you know, they somehow play sort of like a domino effect, and you see other countries actually wanting to 
uh, either become members or begin to uh, um, implement some uh, uh, reforms. I'm thinking here in Southeast Asia, for instance, the case of Thailand, uh, whether they will move along to uh, adopt some standards to become uh, very much embedded in the region, in the um, international production systems of automobiles, or even listening to a country like Indonesia uh, that is not embedded in the systems, but nevertheless saying uh, that they want to use the agreement to change course and uh, promote uh, some reforms. So the se but my second and final question refers to what actions uh, should the global uh, community uh, take to maximize <laughs> the impact of today's and tomorrow's agreements on uh, development? And you know, here are some uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, they, they're not meant to be sort of a, 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 um, you know, a inclusive, a inclusive of all, but I think are, are, are relevant. First is improve the coherence uh, between the multilateral trading system and uh, preferential trade agreements. Uh, for example, insofar as the new agreements achieve progress uh, in the area of regulatory uh, cooperation and convergence, Plurilateral agreements under the WTO umbrella, for example, uh, could be a device uh, to extend the approach to non-members uh, of these preferential trade agreements. Second point is that I, we definitely need to find um, uh, a way to provide uh, new energy uh, to the multilateral trading system. Uh, you know, simply telling governments uh, to go back to Geneva uh, won't do the trick. Um, uh, and I think this is very relevant, in particular, uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, change the perception that the cost of, non, uh, of no agreement is lower uh, than the cost of agreement. And here, there are many good ideas that have been put in place, including by some people in this uh, house, by uh, Gary, by Jeff, uh, by others. Uh, flexible architecture that allows for different speeds uh, and different types of reforms uh, can be relevant. Third point is monitoring uh, and evaluating uh, uh, preferential trade agreements. And this is very important because this is something that, although there's a little bit of this that is being done today, reality is that much more can be done. For instance, in uh, something that may uh, be similar to the G20 uh, monitoring trade reports uh, that may allow a better understanding of what is it that some of these agreements contain, that some of these today and tomorrow uh, agreements contain. And finally, I think that there is, it's very important uh, to help developing countries adjust and benefit from the new global trading system. Um, at the World Bank, we are shaping our country engagements uh, to help policymakers identify what would be the main impact of these uh, uh, agreements and to design appropriate policy uh, responses, uh, technical assistance, uh, financial support in particular. Uh, to strengthen developing countries' capabilities to comply with standards, I think it's going to be key uh, in going forward. So let me stop here, uh, Marcus. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Well, along with others, I'd like to thank Pascal uh, for coming. Uh, as I think everyone in this room knows, uh, he's both one of the best and most experienced minds in international trade today. So thank you for for being with us. And it's a real pleasure to be here with Annabella. As she mentioned, we first worked together about a decade ago on uh, CAFTA. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm delighted she's moved to the post at the World Bank. And I can see she'll make very valuable contributions there. And I hope, as some of your comments suggested at the end, uh, the World Bank WTO cooperation that Pascal and I started will continue. Because I, I think some of the ideas that you've suggested would be very important uh, for the WTO. Uh, Pascal is known for his superb con conceptual structures. Uh, when we were doing negotiations, I always had an interest in them. Some of our counterparts were a little less uh, patient with them. Uh, I, I think in this case, uh, it's a very helpful way at looking, one cut of looking at the trade agenda. Uh, I think the lines may, among these agreements may be drawn a little bit more sharply than I would have drawn them, but I think that's partially a, a form of explanation. Um, the focus on precaution, which is a term that I know Pascal uses for analytical purposes, always makes me cringe a little bit uh, because uh, the history of the, the lexicon is important in terms of the associations people carry with it. And I think in this case, uh, it will raise a sensitive issue with uh, wide, uh, a broader discussion of the trade community here because, of course, uh, 
as I know you would acknowledge, it, it involves a risk assessment, it involves questions of burdens of proofs, it involves questions of assumptions uh, and methodology, <clears throat> and whether fairly or not, there's a view in the U.S. trade community, those have been used for protectionist purposes. So um, as an analytic method, I know this is a big leap, but you might want to come up with another term that says the same thing without some of the associations. Um, what I'd like to do today is to, to complement what Pascal said uh, from a political economy perspective, and in doing so, maybe try to integrate some of his uh, I think conceptual thoughts. So in doing so, I, I want to make four points in particular. Um, first, when I look at TPP, what it highlights to me is the importance of building on advances in trade policy. You don't hear much of this in the current debate, I think, uh, whether fairly or unfairly, because the administration would like to say this is a totally new, different type of trade agreement and everything is new and everything in the past was mistaken. Um, you, you got 11 countries other than the United States in this, six of which we already have free trade agreements. As a negotiator, I can assure you you would have never gotten TPP done if you hadn't done a lot of the work, the baseline work with uh, those other uh, six countries to start. And indeed, when you look at the five <coughs> that added, uh, Pascal talked about Vietnam and Malaysia. Uh, those have a significance in a perhaps a strategic sense. I think economically the big change here is Japan. The other way, you have New Zealand, which always means to me dairy, and Brunei, which is oil, which we don't have barriers on. So uh, this is really adding Japan. That's a very big move, which I don't think would have happened in Japan absent the U.S.-Korea FTA, which got the Japanese recognizing the need to move. Um, and I think uh, the idea of the importance of these trade agreements building on each other also affects domestic politics. And I, I'm adding this point because I saw an editorial in the FT this week, and it was on a different point. It was trying to talk about Great Britain and free trade agreements, but it was suggesting that bilateral FTAs are too difficult for the United States, too much work. As you see, I actually believe they can grow into other things, but actually I think there's an important political perspective on this. When we were pushing a round of free trade agreements about 10 or 15 years ago, part of the idea was to make them a regular order with Congress. They almost become a regular piece of business. Um, and if you go back and you look at the votes, there actually were a reasonable number of Democratic votes for a lot of those FTAs. I think Australia got about 80 votes in the Senate. Most of them were in the high 200s, low 300s. Every once in a while, the unions, and therefore the Democratic Party would pick a target, as CAFTA was, so that was a very hard-fought one. But I think it's an important idea, if you believe in the politics of trade policy, of kind of whether we'll get back to a process where we keep this as a continual flow. And I partly emphasize this because I think when President Obama made his effort to get TPA over the last year, part of the problem was he hadn't been making the case for six years. And frankly, it was a little, I talked with members of the Democratic side as well as the Republican side, and it was a little hard to get the caucus to turn on a dime if you haven't been making the argument for six years. So I partly think this is a, also, I think, an important role of the Peterson Institute here. Peterson Institute has been sort of a policy and intellectual leader, and I think that the next 2016, 2017 are going to be very important in the future structure of trade policy on that. Second point, uh, following on the first, it's very important that we be thinking now about how to make TPP organic. So wherever you come down of what's new and what's old, what I mean by that is, can we add new members? So Korea is obviously one potential candidate. There are ASEAN countries that have been talked about. I spoke about this with the Prime Minister of Mongolia because it would be a good way to show kind of the economic, uh, legal, and uh, other environment for Mongolia. Um, third, TTIP. I think Pascal has highlighted an issue that he and I have both talked about primarily in Europe about the real benefits of this agreement obviously being standards and regulation. We know that there are traditional barriers, but those traditional barriers, to be frank, are politically difficult. So it's a, it's a big political lift to get those removed. And as Pascal properly pointed out, standards and regulations issues take a lot more time. It's harder with the regulatory agencies. 
Uh, it's different politics. You can't trade off the U.S. environmental standard on this for the European health standard on that. Um, and most important, it affects the domestic politics, as his example of Germany makes very clear. Germany, a traditionally free trading country, is highly sensitive that it's going to lower its standards. There will be a reverse political challenge on the U.S. side, which is the fear that this agreement would take European, in American view, over-regulation which is slow growth and productivity, and impose it on the United States. So I think there will be, to get the benefits of regulations and standards, there will be a need on both sides to really explain this agreement differently than it's been done. And in practical terms, look, if I were going to give you my best guess, the administration will support TTIP rhetorically. It won't do much on the agreement. It will, certainly won't get it done. It's in part, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I think it'll be worried about the effect on votes for TPP and anything causes anxiety. Um, it will ultimately blame internal European processes for that, and I think that's a big mistake. So one push I hope that comes out of this effort by the Peterson Institute and others is to say, look, what could reasonably get done on TTIP in 2016 so to set this up as a real potential topic for the next U.S. president, and you still will have another three years, I think, for that commission mandate. So that could be quite important. And Pascal has hinted at this. There's been some other good work done on this in standards regulation. The simple way I would approach this would be to try to take some of the sectors that are already transatlantic, autos, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, big machinery, maybe some processed food products, and get the industries to try to come up with ways that they would not lower the quality of the standards, but look for ways they can reduce costs. We now have another issue to deal with given the Volkswagen problem, and that is we're not only talking about standards, we're talking about enforcement. So, the, of course, you'll hear the Americans say, oh, you've got really high standards, you just don't bother to enforce them um, until our regulators uh, discover what has been done. That'll add sort of some of the political complexity. But I think if the EC and the United States in 2016 could set up a pathway to say, here's the sectors we're working on in regulatory purposes. There's other transparency and items that, in a sense, are reflected in the Administrative Procedure Act of the United States and in similar European processes, and figure out kind of a, uh, an attractive uh, opportunity. So I've suggested that we take the tariff area, um, and frankly, I don't care whether it's 95 percent, 97 percent, I don't care whether it's 10 years, 15 years, but come up with a package to say we could eliminate these tariffs once we get the rest of the agreement. I think if that were targeted in 2016 and people shifted the expectations and began the explanation that Pascal and I have talked about, um, I think that could be uh, very important going forward. Fourth point. Uh, and and some of Annabella's comments bring us to that. So let's connect this again to the global agenda. Well, I've touched on that a little bit with TPP expansion and obviously TTIP. But Annabella knows this well. You know, at the time that we were trying the free trade area of the Americas, which we inherited from the Clinton administration, valuable ideal, I always thought with Venezuela and Argentina this was going to be a bit of a long march, um, that we had free trade agreements that were negotiated now with 50% of the non-US GDP. So if I were guiding American trade policy, I would say not now, because Brazil's got its hands full, but at some point there may be a government in Brazil that says, look, we actually do have to change some of our policies. And here this is where uh, the Pacific Alliance and the, the TPP and others could create a context of this. So in the same way in which TPP drew on bilaterals, you could do something more on the Western Hemisphere side if conditions open up. Uh, the WTO, uh, and I think Annabella's comments suggested this, my own sense is that to be able to get progress, we're going to have to move in sectors or categories. So the ITA 2 agreement was a good example, the trade facilitation. Services is the big one out there now for the reasons we know in a unique category. Uh, Peterson Institute's done some good work on this. You know, for Countries such as China that recognize the risks of what they call the middle income trap, but I know Adam doesn't like the term, but let's just suggest we'll call it increasing productivity at higher incomes. Um, services are very important in that. So again, I, I think this is a very uh, significant potential opportunity. And let me make another point related to China again, because some people see TPP as organized against China. 
I think it's all the more important <coughs> that the United States in particular, but with Europe and others, move forward other items on the agenda. So the Chinese are interested in a bit. Uh, I don't suggest that's going to be politically easy, but I think there's a lot of progress that can be made. And it's, it's striking to me that on both the service sector and the bit, the Chinese have moved to a negative list, which you won't find the Brazilians and Indians moving to. Now, the, the exceptions are too long. I understood the most recent visit of Xi Jinping actually narrowed the exceptions. Uh, I gather it's still too long. But this, to me, is an opportunity to create some win-win possibilities here. And again, if I take the services and the WTO and, and the BIT uh, possibilities, this is a way of suggesting to the Chinese, along with ideas such as the steps that China might take to be accepted as a part of the SDR, uh, dealing with some of the currency issues, where you could and should make progress together. So in sum, um, my very strong belief, and I think it's been borne out by, interestingly enough, by 15 years now since Fred and I were talking about competitive liberalization, is, is that you now have a process where you see how these things build on one another. They build on it in policy terms, as Pascal was talking about. So when we first put trade and environmental provisions in our bilateral FTAs, they weren't as extensive as they've become. I don't know how extensive they'll become, but people have become a little bit more accommodating to some of these issues. And similar with some of the new sectors that Annabelle mentioned. They're important in terms of international politics. Now and then, you have to get the right moment in the world economy and national economies, people absorbing what's happened. And I think this is where I perhaps am a slight contrarian. I think it's important on the domestic economy. I think it's important for the United States to keep on offense in the congressional context on uh, trade. So the one item I haven't talked about, but I'll defer because I've spoken long enough, is the prospects for TPP passage, but I'll leave that if people want to get that into the question and answer. Thank you. Um, Pascal, would you like to respond to any of this, or should we go directly to questions? All right, very, very brief uh, remarks. A, uh, I totally agree, while I didn't insist on that, with the point that both uh, Annabelle and Bob have made, which is that in the area of precaution, you should not talk about negotiations. If you start calling something a trade negotiation, and it has to do with precaution convergence, you get the narrative wrong from the very beginning, because you give the impression that precaution is something you can trade off. Precaution is not something you can trade off. It's something you can discuss, you can harmonize, you can converge. But the moment you give the impression that I'm going to exchange my level of precaution against your level of precaution, you're dead politically. Second, uh, on the semantics, Bob, uh, I know your uh, well-known uh, reaction on the word precaution, and we discussed that uh, quite a bit for the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Uh, <coughs> I just want it to be clear that the ones that invented the precautionary principles are the US, with the Clean Air Act in the 1970s. And at the time, uh, Europe was still in the Stone Age of polluter payer. Now, it's true, for a variety of reasons, the US uh, moved back uh, since, and the Europeans have moved forward in terms of using precaution as a concept. But you invented it. We didn't. Uh, third, uh, totally agree, and that's my uh, third and only remark at this stage, totally agree with Bob uh, when he mentioned uh, this uh, sensitive issue of uh, uh, Volkswagen. Why? Why is Volkswagen good news for the TTIP? Volkswagen is good news for the TTIP because in Europe, most people are convinced that uh, Europe is great about precaution and US is terrible. That's what conventional wisdom says, you know, sort of, in EU, nothing you can do until it's formally authorized. In the US, everything you can do until it's formally forbidden, you know, sort of conventional wisdom. And that matters for public opinions if you don't put the record straight. 
putting the record straight is looking at facts and regulation. And if you look at facts and regulation, you roughly realize that in one third of the cases, EU is higher than US in precaution. In one third of the cases, the US is higher than EU. And what you said about enforcement is part of that. And in one third of the cases, the level of precaution and enforcement is roughly the same, but the way it is done is so different that it has the same impact of segregation if I'm a producer. And that's where the Volkswagen thing comes in. It's, it was a reminder to many Europeans that these guys may be serious about precaution also on the other side. Uh, and uh, although I wouldn't yeah, I wouldn't say it's good news for everybody. It certainly is good news for rebalancing part of this popular conventional wisdom, uh, which a number of anti-TTIP uh, people are pushing in Europe. And I'm not saying they, they don't have a point. Uh, I have myself criticized a lot the way the European Commission and to some extent USTR have wrongly uh, uh, sort of narrative uh, sort of told what this negotiation is about. So they, they, they clearly have a point. For instance, the fact that while the thing is about precaution, you decide that the mandate will remain secret is a huge political blunder. You know, if you want to have a problem about precaution, uh, keep it secret or say the mandate is secret. So that, that was stupid. And by the way, it's one of the areas where this transition from protection to precaution has <coughs> a bearing on the way you interact with the public opinion and you trigger a necessary uh, public debate, again, because legitimization is extremely important in these areas because it impacts people's lives. And I think if that's the case, you have to be more transparent. Okay, well, we have about 20 minutes for discussion. We have a roving mic. We also have a mic in the center of the room. Uh, so, uh, first question, Fred Bergston. Uh, actually, if I may, a quick question for each speaker. Um, Only Fred gets to answer, ask more than one question. We've got a pretty full house and we've got 20 minutes, okay? Very brief. Pascal, you suggested one place we ought to have new international negotiations, I think you would call them, is in the area of investment. My experience over a long period is that international investment has been booming, <coughs> but every time we try to talk about it, we bog down. And even simple investment negotiations, like bits between the US and China, US India, go nowhere. Do you really think the international investment process would be helped by trying to negotiate international agreement? For Annabelle, you start out by saying worries about the link between the multilateral system and the regional agreements. But as Bob mentioned right at the end of his comments, there's a massive multilateral agenda underway. All these huge plurilaterals on services, on environmental goods, <laughs> on revising the procurement agreement, on ITA. So the WTO negotiating process in and around it is alive and well. So why do you worry about the link between the two? Bob, you said rightly, <coughs> PPP should be organic. We know at least half a dozen countries are out there ready to uh, apply and come in. How would you handle China? Okay, let's collect our questions. I got a line of four people at the mic already. Sherman Katz, please Thank introduce you. yourself and your affiliation. Sure, uh, Sherman Katz, Center for Study of the Presidency. And it, this question is about China picking up from where Fred left off. I start with it being for Ambassador Zellick, but the others, please comment. Uh, Bob, you said almost precisely 10 years ago that China should be a responsible stakeholder in the system. And I wonder if you would share with us <laughs> your evaluation, be kind enough to share now, as to whether China indeed has become a responsible stakeholder. Let's leave aside uh, South China Sea. Let's stay in WTO for the moment. And of course, as you know, many in Geneva are saying until the US and China can get together with China paying much more on agriculture, paying much more on uh, market access in manufacturing, nothing uh, will happen in WTO. Nice narrow question. Yes, please. 
Hi, uh, Victoria Guido with Politico. Um, my question is for any of you. Um, it's about the WTO, and um, you know, you all framed the agreements today in terms of you know yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, the Doha round or whatever is left of it uh, seems to sort of be stuck a little bit in yesterday. That seems to be the sense. Um, they are trying to pull something together. Um, I'm wondering how you would see any sort of small package agreement in Nairobi and um, whether you see a, a role for multilateral negotiations uh, in the near future or whether, um, as Mr. Bergson suggested, it's going to simply be plurilaterals. Next. Hi, uh, I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Uh, question is also about China. Um, I'll ask it more clearly. So, um, do you think China should or shouldn't join TPP? Because they've already shown their interest in joining it. Who are you and asking? Then, yeah, and then the second question. No second question. No Who second are you asking the first question to? Uh, Mr. Zalik and Mr. Lai. Okay, please. The gentleman standing behind you. Yes, uh, 21st Century Business Herald, China. Also about TPP and China. Um, there is a, a, a report, uh, including some uh, three professors, including one from the uh, 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 size across the Mass Avenue, said that uh, if China joined TPP, uh, China will contribute to close to 50% uh, of the export, and while U.S. will also benefit a lot, uh, the, the, the first benefit of, of uh, when China joined TPP. So I wonder, uh, 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 I wonder why. Um, World Bank or, or uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Lamy or, or uh, Goldman Sachs uh, did such similar research uh, on, on the scenario of uh, China, if China joined the TPP, what would happen? And if so, uh, China contributed a lot and the U.S. gained a lot. So at the first stage, what do you think China is not, uh, was not invited by U.S.? Thanks. Thank you. I think we have a lot of interest in China, Pascal. Uh, on, on Fred's question, on investment, uh, I still hold the view that a multilateral investment regime would be a great thing to have. Uh, it would make things much simpler. Uh, of course, lawyers would make less money, but that's, after all, good for the consumer, because at the end of the day, they pay for that a way or another. Short of getting there, I think, what we should try and do is to have the equivalent of the SPS TBT in investment. By the way, I also hold this view for services. All these areas around domestic regulation, in a way, are a bit confused. If there was a basic multilateral agreement that establishes a balance and which would establish what are the normal rights of an investor in a country, that would help. At least you would have a sort of single standard on which you can go plus or not, depending uh, on what you want to do. Uh, and the notion that you know, the uh, text of principle like the SPS and the TBT establishes a balance between precaution and protection, which is also the issue about investment protection, I think would be a good thing. Uh, on, on China, uh, I think China paid its WTO accession at a very high price, and that uh, we've since paid the price of this high price uh, in the fact that China, since it joined WTO, didn't seriously open its trade, including in an area where it needs to open trade if it wants to keep growing, which is services which is by, by the way, whether China or not will join TISA is a crucial, uh, of a crucial importance. Uh, so that's a reality. Uh, and again, so far, and you know, it's a bit of a joke to keep calling China a recently acceded member in WTO, let's be frank. Uh, this, is, this is language for diplomats. Nobody who lives in real life will keep calling China a recently exited uh, country. Now, on TPP, as we all know, there are 
various views. In China, we even had an op-ed in the China Daily who said, why should China uh, start considering joining TPP? And I think those who are in favor of that are in favor of that because they believe that TPP contains a number of elements which would trigger domestic reform in China, starting, of course, uh, with the state-owned enterprise issue, which at the beginning was a poison pill uh, in the initial frame of the TPP negotiation by the US to make sure that China would not join. You know, but China plays Go. Huh? They don't play chess, they play Go. And at some stage, they might very well decide to do that if they gather the necessary uh, political energy to do to overcome the huge vested interests which the state-owned enterprises represent in China and which have been somehow sort of ossified uh, with, uh, with uh, corruption. Uh, and finally, on Doha, uh, you're absolutely right. It's uh, stoked uh, in uh, yesterday's world. But I didn't say yesterday's world was totally dead. It's dying. <laughs> but if there's an area where the old protection mantra still is extremely lively, it's agriculture. And by coincidence, none of these bilateral agreements, nor TPP, nor TTIP, nor anything of this kind, will seriously deal with an important issue, which is agricultural subsidization. So there remains in the old world a few of these things, and that's where Doha is stuck, and Doha will remain stuck, in my view, as long as this agricultural issue, this agriculture not, will not be cracked. And let's be frank, the obstacle to this agricultural not being cracked is one country on this planet, the name of which I don't think I need to insist on in Washington. Bob? India? <laughs> uh, that was a little unfair, but... <laughs> Um, look, so, um, God, there's so many good questions here. Let me, let me try to integrate things around China on responsible stakeholder in, in TPP. But first, uh, let's go back to what the responsible stakeholder was trying to address. This is now getting a bit dated, but we have some veterans in this room. Um, so much of the focus on U.S. policy towards China um, after the opening was on trying to integrate China into the world economy through the WTO accession. That was the big challenge of the 90s, accomplished finally in, in 2001. So the point of the speech was partly to say, what could be a new concept that people in the United States could organize around? And the idea was that uh, the integration concept could be applied across a broad range of activities, hence being a stakeholder, and that as China benefited from the international system that the United States and others had helped create over 50, 60 years, that it should take responsibilities in that. And it's been kind of interesting how this idea has been a bit of a political football because from the U.S. point of view, it was up to the U.S. to decide whether this had been met, so I don't really think it conceded a great deal. Um, but nevertheless, some people thought that it was the same as saying China was a responsible stakeholder, which was not the point. Um, I do think, as Pascal mentioned and all of us mentioned, it creates the opportunity for adroit use with reformers in China of how you can use the international system, whether WTO, BID, SDR, and others, to support the reform process uh, as well. Now, as for the situation today, I divide it into three categories, and I'm not going to go on too long on this because it requires more uh, extensive treatment. But in Asia-Pacific security matters like the South China Sea, obviously we're far away from having a shared understanding, <coughs> but part of this isn't an overwhelming surprise to me. You have a rising power, and again, I think the U.S. position actually as, as implemented recently uh, was emphasizing a key global principle of freedom of navigation, and that's probably what we should be stressing. Cyber is the one I'm most worried about, and I can't go into the detail of that. The optimistic side would be that this agreement that was struck, or at least starting, 
remind some people of what happened in nonproliferation 20 years ago. We started this discussion with China about 20 years ago on nonproliferation, and frankly, China had businesses, they had relationships and others that they eventually had to exit, and that would be the constructive view. I think cyber is more, even more complicated because I'm not sure that the U.S. and Europe and Japan and other allies actually have an agreed concept about how to deal with cyber in all its dimensions. So I'll, I'll leave that one at that. The second issue is beyond the Asia Pacific, whether issues of Pakistan, Afghanistan, UN peacekeeping, Africa, dealing with Iran, or for that matter we'll see, but perhaps climate change. I honestly think that there has been some good work with China. So the real danger is kind of in the Asia Pacific security space. On the economic one, um, I, I promised Graham Allison actually today, right before I came here, to do a full list of this, which maybe I should share with Fred Bergson and we could compare it. But here, here's some points. In the financial crisis, actually, depends on your view on stimulus policies, but the Chinese and U.S. stimulus were you know, far in excess of others. I think they kind of handled it pretty responsibly. Um, both of us have a lot of cleanup from the stimulus. Um, there's an interesting story in Hank Paulson's book how the Russians say, ah, oh, this is a moment of U.S. weakness. Let's really squeeze the U.S. with dollar security. And the Chinese are saying, well, wait a minute. Why would we want to do that? That would mess up the international economic system. Let's not try that idea. That was somewhat revealing to me about kind of attitudes <coughs> on this issue. Um, if you look at uh, the support that I got at the World Bank or trying to support on the Ida side, frankly, the Chinese were very cooperative, not only in terms of broader development, but frankly, the China 2030 report, which we work with them, which became the basis for their structural reforms. If you look at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, I think that was, uh, frankly, a potentially very good idea. I think the U.S. made a mistake in trying to oppose it. I think the U.S. has now recognized that. This was a wonderful example. Much of my diplomatic career, I spent you know, having other countries tell the United States what we should spend money on. Here, the Chinese are willing to put some money forward on infrastructure. and if they did it in a way with governance and environment and other issues, which I, Chairman Jin's been here at the, the Peterson Institute, I think could go well. On trade, as Pascal mentioned, you know, this is all relative, but on the, the, the WTO accession that China agreed to is far more open than Brazil or India or other middle-income countries. Um, and uh, are there issues that one needs to, and I mentioned the negative list is kind of an approach. So on the economic side, I don't mean to be Pollyannish. There's work on government procurement, services, open capital account, two-way investment, and there will be big battles in China, and there will be frustrations, and the intellectual property rights issue related to cyber is obviously a big issue. I continue to find many reformers in China that want to move in a direction that I think the U.S. would like the international economic system to, uh, to have uh, sort of the core principles. So I think it'd be a big mistake to abandon that, and that brings me to TPP. Look, we, we have to recognize the role of politics and, and power and danger and other issues, the political security issues. So what I would do with China would be, as I explained, I would say, look, the components of the TPP might not be something that you're actually ready for. Even if you signed on, you couldn't implement it. But let's work at the elements that fit your reform program. Let's work at the Bilateral Investment Treaty, which, by the way, is the similar to the investment package you would have in TPP. The question is, can we have that with Europe? Obviously, the Chinese are more willing to allow an international investment arbitration than some in Europe are. Um, if, you, if you make the services sector negotiation the WTO, that's another key area. The SDR is going to be very important towards an open capital account. So I would continue to try to find an agenda with the Chinese. And in good political economy sense, and to complement the administration on this, they use China's uh, chairing of the APEC to push Chinese agreement on the ITA, too. Well, keep in mind, China's the chair of the G20 next year, if memory serves. So it would be a good opportunity to try to make some headway on some of those issues. And then the last point that I just want to make a connection to something that Fred said is, you know, when I used to have conversations with Pascal about governance and systems and others, I always had a sort of final recourse, which is von Hayek's notion of spontaneous order. So where Pascal always wanted a structure and an agreement, I always felt if we're not quite there, there can be an order created through sort of competition and private sector role, which is partly what the competitive trade liberalization strategy is about, is partly what investment is about. 
And I think this is very important now because I think this is another area that Peterson Institute has done a lot of work in. It spends a lot of time on the macro and monetary policies. I think the monetary policies are running their course here. And we're going to have to have a handoff to private sector-led growth. And what we're going to start to find is countries that want to differentiate themselves by who's doing the structural reforms. And that's a very nice opening to a trade and investment agenda. That's why I would suggest it's not incomprehensible over the next five years. You might have a Brazilian government that looks on these issues differently. You might even have an Indian government that takes some of these issues. And we need to be positioned as the U.S., again, as a leader in the international trade system, working with others, the World Bank, EU, and others, to take advantage of those spontaneous moments and not be too captive to do we have the exact perfect structure of governance right. Annabelle. All right, well, I'm, I'm, I, you know, Fred, I, I haven't heard many people say that the negotiating function of the WTO is alive and well uh, uh, recently. Um, I think that there's a very important result, which is the Trade Facilitation Agreement. Um, the ITA is also an important result, and, and uh, uh, others, uh, others may come. But I think that there is great frustration in, um, in Geneva. Uh, first, of course, on uh, what to do with the uh, with the Doha round, uh, because you know you may argue, of course, that uh, that the process has not been working. But reality is, and I think that Pascal mentioned this, is that the issues uh, that are being discussed in Doha are are still very relevant and will not go away uh, by the fact that uh, we're not able to find a, a agreement on them. Uh, and the other issue, I think, is you know. But how to move forward uh, in uh, in the future, and um, and I think that the um, the solution to this goes to uh, again a flexible architecture uh, with different uh, speeds, uh, different uh, depth, allowing for different countries to come together, negotiating issues of common interest, and maybe opening the way for others. But I think that for that to happen uh, in a sort of in a broader way. Uh, there, we need to find uh, uh, sort of uh, some kind of agreement on uh, on the Doha round issues that are still uh, that are still pending. And until that happens, uh, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't think that uh, this negotiating function is uh, is that alive and uh, and well. Okay. Well, I know there are many questions in the audience, but I also know that we're approaching our witching hour. Uh, my test of the success of these meetings is whether we keep the audience. And uh, I can tell you from sitting here in the front looking out, virtually not a single person has left today. And not only did we keep the audience, I, the, the interest was so high that I didn't have to resort to any of the questions that I had uh, written out in advance <laughs> in case of the dreaded you know, dead silence when people get finished speaking. So uh, at least from our perspective, this has uh, been a great success. Uh, join me in thanking our three speakers, Pascal Lamy, Bob Zellick, and Abel Gonzalez. <laughs>